So yeah, what I want to do is basically to give you a little bit an idea of what the SGG oncology is about, what we discussed. We had now, as you've heard in the, in the intro from Pierre, basically it is a newly formed <coughs> SGG, so essentially it exists roughly a year, not, not quite, but roughly a year. And uh, we had a couple of meetings where we discussed what do we want to do from a strategic point, where do we want to focus, um, what do we want to engage to, to happen, so to say, on a, on a scientific side, on a clinical development side, regulatory patient, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of what I do. But please see, see that as a kind of a, a discussion area and a discussion forum. So what we are really want to be here to discuss with you, are we on the right track? Are we missing anything? Would you, would you focus? Would you put basically the emphasis on anything else what we present here, would you do it anywhere different, and so on and so forth. So that's the idea of the, of the, 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 the whole day, actually. So the schemes for the SGG oncology are basically that we sort of write, okay, if you want to be ambitious, if you want to be innovative, if you really want to move the needle and, and kind of push the envelope, where do we need to be and what do we need to do? And where are the, the gaps, so to say, what can we achieve? In, in five to 10 years time, which is basically the running time of the of uh, IMI2. So, and then we said, okay, the, the mission and the vision of the SGG oncology is really to define projects that will aspire to effectively double the following parameters by 2020, 2025. And that's why we called it basically the five doubles. So we really want to launch projects, engage projects, and foster basically a platform where projects can talk about and can really move uh, and, and double progression-free survival, overall survival, what's currently standard in, of course, every disease area, which is different, we know that. Second, of course, the number of, of uh, patients who have really access to innovative, personalized medicines and, and across Europe and, and even broader than that. We also want to make sure that we engage in projects which kind of help to speed the drug development do not have such a lead time of five to 10 years until it really is available to the, broad to the broad public, so to say, and not only patients in clinical trials. Treatment tolerability, reducing side effects, reducing basically the way that, that uh, patient uh, experience and, and suffer, so to say, also not only by the treatment, but also uh, not only by the disease, but even more so by the, by the uh, drug treatment. And of course, cost effectiveness and, and cancer drug development is also something which goes also in patient access uh, to innovative medicines. So that's basically our, if you want, our five, five major points we want to hit uh, um, with uh, the SGG oncology and projects kind of really should go in this direction to help us to, to achieve that. The other thing, what have we said, what we kind of want to, to, to foster, what are we really kind of, is our scheme, our mission and vision, so to say. So we called it integrated dynamic personalized cancer care. And what that means is really that we, we kind of want to combine everything. We not want to look basically at one parameter alone. We really want to try to integrate many, many things under one umbrella. And of course, it needs to be uh, subdivided in various groups and as well, basically, of course, in, in, in many other ways uh, how that can be achieved. So one is, of course, going beyond patient stratification. And what we mean here is really that we want to kind of follow the patient over time and not only diagnose the patient, so to say, at the beginning of the treatment. Changing drug treatments and changing it basically, seeing what happens if a patient is under a certain treatment, when is time to switch it, and not only doing that by clinical parameters, but even more so by molecular parameters. I will talk about that in the next uh, uh, couple of slides. We also want to talk, look a little bit more about context dependency or context specificity. And there is one project which I will quickly talk about, we call mute omics. And what that means basically, if you look at, at tumors, I mean tumors are not only genetic. So if you want to understand a tumor, we have to go beyond the genes. We have to understand what's the consequence of the mutation, not only the mutation alone. So we need to understand better if a, if a cancer has a cert, certain mutational pattern, what is the consequence on the expression pattern? What's the consequence on the proteins? What's the consequence on the metabolome, et cetera, et cetera. So this is something what we call basically integrating the mutation and the omics basically which are available now and coming available in the following years. The other one is of course, and I mean no one can live without it anymore in any kind of project you do is immune oncology. And, and there is a project coming which is called Tumor Microenvironment, we just discussed it two days ago, which really means how can we identify patients who should be on certain treatments for immune checkpoint inhibitors, how can we identify how long they should be on, how can we identify which kind of targeted therapy in combination with an immune oncology or immuno-immuno, 
and so on and so forth are the best. And this is, of course, meant in understanding the tumor microenvironment. This is where the drug acts. This is where the drug basically plays an important role, and, and even more so basically outside the mutation space. And I will talk about that also a little bit more. Selfie DNA, broader liquid biopsy. It's also a big topic where we feel like we can really make a difference in, in patients' life as well as basically in the treatment paradigms so that we have the opportunity to assess, so to say, what happens to a, to a tumor, what happens to a patient if the patient basically is not, need, doesn't need a biopsy. I mean, five times a biopsy is not fun and sometimes not even possible and even dangerous. So the question is, can we circumvent that and still gather the information in a comprehensive way from the tumor? And that's where we feel liquid biopsy, sulfur DNA, is, uh, is the tool to do it. And there we want to foster projects who really help to, to engage and to, to bring this technology forward. Second, and or, or last, basically, the era of big data. I mean, you all heard about it, and, and we will also talk about that, that we have actually here uh, three projects already ongoing, or better to say, uh, starting. One is called Harmony, I will talk about that. The other one is called the Big Five, and then there's also one of the prostate um, initiative, and, and that's something I will, I will run you through in a minute. So regarding the, uh, um, the projects we are, we are really looking forward to is, is one is Harmony, which is kind of already kind of launched, so it will go live very soon. Um, that's, a, that's a project to really focus, it's a bit loud, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, so Harmony is basically a project who really works on, on hematological diseases. And oh, that's a demonstration, right? Ah. These are your fans. Thank you, thank you. And now I feel good. <laughs> and uh, so Harmony is a, is a project, actually, which is um, talking about hematological malignancies. So the idea is here really to understand what's the outcome of hematological diseases um, what is the outcome basically in certain areas under different treatment regimens? What is basically uh, the outcome in different regions? And that's a project basically which has already been discussed and, and, and brought forward over the last, yeah, almost two years, and it's now going live. The other one, as I said, is, and this is the, the, the really tangible things what the SGG already brought forward in, in about a year. The other one is what I said, mute omics, where we really want to understand contextual dependency much better than, uh, than it is now. For real-world evidence, three projects. One will focus on the major solid tumors, um, and this is basically not yet clear. Um, we're still discussing which tumor areas we should go into, and we really welcome your feedback um, in, in what kind of solid tumors as a comparison to Harmony. Harmony is only hematological malignancies, big five or big three or whatever we will, big seven, I mean, uh, we will see what we end up with. Um, that's basically a project which does exactly the same. What's the outcome in breast cancer across Europe? What's the outcome in breast cancer <coughs> in various disease stages? What's the outcome in breast cancer when treat different treatment sequences are given, et cetera, et cetera? The same is basically for a very specific project because people felt this is very kind of um, it's a specific need for prostate cancer, and this is also a project who is going to be uh, launched and brought forward, and uh, prostate cancer is initiated by, uh, by Bayer. Um, Mute Omics is initiated by uh, um, Novartis. Harmony is Novartis and Celgene, and the tumor microenvironment project, as I said, is initiated by Merck. And, and those projects are really what we, what we try to drive and what we try to bring forward in, in uh, actually launching them in the next year, so which is called Call 11, which is April next year, and Call 12, which is October next year. Why do we believe real-world evidence is important? Why do we believe we need to do something in terms of harmony, in terms of the big five, three, prostate cancer, and so on and so forth? The reason is very clear. When you look about how many people are really in clinical trials from the cancer patients and how many are not, it's strikingly different. So there's only three to five percent, it depends on regions and on so and so and so forth, end of diseases, et cetera, no question. But there's only three to five percent of patients who really participate and have the, the, the luxury in, in a way to be uh, early on in, in innovative medicines and participating in trials. But the majority of data gathered and the majority of data, basically what happens to those patients in real world, happens outside clinical trials. That is exactly the data pool we don't have access yet. We don't see 
what happens when the truck is on the market so much anymore. We can't follow it. The, treat the, rate, the regional practice is different. The, the way how treatments are given, in which sequence they are given, when are they stopped and why are they stopped, and so and so forth. That's all what we don't see and what we don't get. But this is extremely important information um, in order to change the way trucks are developed, in order to change the treatments are given. And that's projects where we really believe we can make a difference when we get this information really comprehensively together, understand with data analytics, and, and it's not easy, there's a lot of things to do also on the, on, the, on the data privacy side, no question, and we would like to also have discussions with you on that one. How do you feel about it, sharing data, enabling data access, et cetera, et cetera. And even more so basically participating in such kind of, uh, um, if you want, crowdsourcing activities that people kind of volunteer data and things like that. So that's kind of where we, why we really feel real world evidence can make a big difference. And that's something where we really think real world evidence has also the opportunity to really bring together industry, government, regulators, academic, payer, providers, and of course patients to help us to really achieve that goal and really close the circle of all parties who are involved in cancer care or in healthcare in general. And that's something where we really feel strong about that the, the circle needs to be really complete. And we cannot only look at it from a company perspective, we cannot only look from a research perspective, things have to come together. And, and this is also as the, the flow of the day will go, you will hear uh, examples on all of those kinds of uh, problems, issues and, and learnings, so to say, over the last couple of years. The idea is really to generate a standardized outcome that we can compare basically mainly what happens in the clinical trials, what happens in the real world evidence. So if you want to have it boiled down to one sentence is we want to generate a kind of a comparator arm with the real world evidence that we understand really what happens in HER2 positive breast cancer, so to say, across Europe. And, and this needs to be seen by what is the first line treatment, what's the second line treatment, when people give it, why do people give it. So that's really what we understand in order to benchmark what is a new truck doing in comparison to what is already happening on the market. And that is something which definitely enables patient access, early patient access. It helps also industry not to waste money for treatments which are not better than the standard. So, and, and of course, I mean, um, this has also a lot to do to identify the right patient. And this has also a lot to do basically which patient to treat and when to treat. And that needs all to come together in, in, uh, in the part of the real world evidence. When we look at cancer, so we really have to say the value in cancer care is shifting. So the last decade, if you want, and, and I, I lived it through, so to say, I started, uh, started off as kind of one of the first people who was doing biomarker work in my um, former company, which was Ross Genentech. And, and uh, basically, this was the, the last 10 years. We were looking at from the right track, the, the right track to the right patient at the right time at the right dose. So that was basically the motto. This was basically the slogan which went, now I think we really need to talk about the right living, the right care, the right value, and the right innovation. And, and that means different things. And that's a lot more comprehensive. So we need to understand how can we, imp how can we do screening better? How can we identify the patient earlier in a treatment disease and basically in a treatment uh, uh, of a certain disease and start earlier with this, uh, with this patient? We need to talk about disease management and also basically which drug is used at which point and, and in the right time. And of course, as I said, the right value. What is worth to bring to the, uh, to the patient and, and in terms of what needs to be really uh, uh, reimbursed, what needs to be uh, made available for, for patients and at which time. And of course, technology, and there is a uh, um, digital health, uh, uh, a big work stream, as you have heard, is also basically how can we access and, and make this data and, and this kind of information a lot better uh, uh, available and more transparent to, to everyone. Also, the key trends in oncology, I mean, we're not going to do more and more of the same. Uh, everyone has learned the lesson, so I mean, we definitely engage much more in smaller, more stratified patient population and, and have more complex treatment regimens. So if you look about it, there's 1.5 higher growth rate in, in low incidence tumors where more and more trials are done in that. And, and uh, a very, very good sign is basically if you do a cross-industry cut, there's around 50% of the trials who really go into stratified patients and not basically all comers anymore. And, uh, and certainly, uh, people understand that subpopulations is the way to go. 
And this is not only at first line, this is also at second line. Then we need also an accelerated innovation and product life cycle. So we need to understand how we really kind of uh, uh, keep the trucks, so to say, available and foster, so to say, also innovation. We definitely have left the, uh, uh, the single arm trials, so to say. We have also left basically uh, the, the stage that we treat patients only with one truck, so combinations is the way to go, and this is not only in immune oncology with targeted or immune oncology, immune oncology, this is targeted, targeted. We're talking about uh, doublets, we're talking about triplets, and this is something where we really kind of um, definitely uh, made a difference uh, to the patients, and we need to understand that better, and, and we need to do more of that. And also the value shifts, um, as I already said, so that means basically the, the big data is really how do we really change what I just said before, the life of a patient, how we have the most impact on a patient, on a company, but also on the society. And of course, as I said, new technologies will definitely play a big role here. Coming to a more scientific point uh, and, and giving you the reason why we believe this is, this is important. So you all know science and technology is continuously evolving. So if you look, and this is an example from lung cancer, uh, basically 2004, I'm not saying lung cancer was easy, but lung cancer was fairly easy to stratify. If you take the same thing in 2014, largely complex. If you take it basically today and or tomorrow, the question is which of those subgroups need to be overlaid and need to be treated in a combination with immune oncology and not only with a single agent, anti-EGFR or whatever you want. And, and that has been made available also by the evolution of technology. So we're not doing Sanger sequencing in a way so much anymore. We're kind of more in the way of kind of doing next-gen sequencing and, and other technologies which are more multiplexing and which help us to understand the tumor much more comprehensive than we had in the past. So, but we need to also make sure that those technologies are robust and we need to make sure that we capture the complexity of the disease. And when I say we need to capture the complexity of the disease, we need to think about what we're dealing with. So what we're dealing with is a highly dynamic uh, um, disease. Cancer is not something which is only driven by one cause. Cancer is driven by many different mutations at many different stages. The, the picture changes. And you all know the, the work from Charles Swanson, Swanson basically many years ago when you take a kind of a renal uh, cancer <laughs> example, so to say, and you punch in in 10 different lesions, you're getting 10 different mutations. What does it tell you? It tells you basically if you do a biopsy, you not necessarily capture the whole, the whole scheme, what's going on in the tumor. You capture only parts of it. Second, you need to understand that an interlesion heterogeneity is present as well. If you take a biopsy from a, from a lymph node, if you take a biopsy from a, from a, a, a skin lesion, from a liver lesion, whatever have you, um, you definitely don't get the same spectrum. And extremely important is also the temporal heterogeneity. What do I mean with that? Temporal heterogeneity means if you diagnose a tumor, no matter what you do uh, today, and you diagnose it a year later, the tumor is not the same. Because the tumor has evolved with, with or without treatment, and, and this is also something we need to take into, into account and need to put into context when we do it. So what have we done in the past, basically? We looked basically from a kind of a preset menu, if you want. We did test A, drug A, test B, drug B, et cetera, et cetera. If the patient was lucky, so to say, the same thing happened at progressive disease or, or when an, a new lesion came on. So we tried to follow basically the paradigm. If you, pay, if you put yourself in a case of a lung cancer patient, highly difficult because it, it means repeated biopsies. And that's not fun and even dangerous. So, and, and we have, if you take a biopsy, a small biopsy, not even having enough material to do all those tests. Your material is often exhausted after the third test. So a fourth or fifth, which you would have to do in lung cancer, um, potentially, um, is not even available. So the other way to do it is kind of to, to look into an NGS panel um, and basically stratify via a, an NGS panel, so to say, the next way and the next wave of innovation and, and s consequently, of course, not only at baseline, also later down the track when the patient is resistant or, or, or relapsed or reoccurs uh, in a natural setting. However, even we do it, even we take a biopsy and we look into the, the a comprehensive way how we assess tumors, we're not getting the whole picture because we're still focusing a little bit on the surface as well as her two-week overexpression, whatever want you, um, mutations, as I already said. So that is only partial, uh, partial picture of the tumor. 
On the other side, we need to understand really very clearly that the microenvironment, how and where the tumor is embedded, plays an equally important role than the mutation alone. So what we're dealing with here, so the, the, the enemy, is a highly complex, a highly dynamic field. What I mean with that is basically you have the heterogeneity of the tumor, and the heterogeneity of the tumor is overlaid by the heterogeneity of the, of the, the tumor microenvironment. The tumor microenvironment is not a homogeneous compartment of the body. It consists of stromal cells, immune cells, endothelial cells, parasites, and many other things. So this kind of microenvironment or, or, or milieu is also changing as the tumor is changing and depends on many, many influences and factors. So if you only do a mutation analysis alone, we certainly don't capture the whole thing. So here's heterogeneity in real life. So what do you want? The smoothie or the fruit bowl? What does it mean? If you punch with a biopsy in your fruit bowl, you may capture you had a kiwi, but you don't know if you have a strawberry, if you have a banana, or if you have a melon. So we need to be more comprehensive, and we need to understand better so to say what it really is, what we're dealing with. On the other hand, it depends on the context. Who of you is using Google Translate? What do you believe the accuracy rate is? It's very, it, very true, it depends on the language, absolutely. Yeah. In average, I was very surprised, there's actually a paper about it. And, <laughs> and um, the accuracy rate in average, is around 50-60%. Suaheli is 12%. And uh, just to let you, you're very right, it depends on the language. What does it mean, contextual dependency? And why do I bring this up? Contextual dependency, you take a word like a book. You can say, I read a book. You can say, book me a flight. And you can say, book him. You take another one, point. You can say, the pencil has a sharp point. You can say, it's not polite to point at people. And you can also say, you have a point. What does it mean? Language is context dependence, so is mutation. Mutation is also context dependent. It depends in which context it occurs and when and how. And that's something we need to factor in when we diagnose and treat patients. And that's something what we really need to change in the future. So we really need to move more into a way how we can assess the, the tumor and the patient, so to say, more comprehensively. One way, and I'm not saying this is the be all end all uh, situation here, is certainly selfie DNA. So selfie DNA is basically a simple blood draw and you can isolate tumor DNA, certainly also normal DNA, absolutely, no question. And then you can measure many, many things, uh, uh, mutations and so on and so forth. So what does it mean if you put yourself in the patient's journey, so to say, you're diagnosed and you want to know what's my optimal therapy, so to say, at the beginning. You take a biopsy, often. You kind of want to know, is the patient responding to your drug or not? You take another biopsy, optimally. Resistant occurs, you need another one. So, and, and that's what I'm saying, is not feasible. But what is feasible? A blood draw at the same time point. You, every cancer patient gets at every visit a blood draw. So it's not even more, more uh, um, efforts or, or creates more, more costs or whatsoever. It's very easy to do. And what that means basically is if we go ahead and do exactly the same on, on selfie DNA as we would do what I said before, we would do on, on the uh, tissue and assess the comprehensively what happens on a mutation spectrum um, with this, with an NGS panel and selfie DNA, we would get definitely a lot more information. The moment we see a change, we need to think about if you want to change treatment. We need to think about can we change a treatment and how can we change a treatment. And that is really dynamic treatment and dynamic treatment assessment of those patients. It's not static. It's not treating until we basically see a change in a, in a, in a scan or whatsoever. This is really a dynamic way where we want to go and, and what we want to do. How to do that? So there are assays available, and this is really just one of them, which can assess 600 genes on cell-free DNA. And this is pan-cancer, where you can really look into it from a, from a pan-cancer perspective. And, and check, so to say, what kind of mutation and in which contexts the mutation occurs on cell-free DNA, which gives you an advantage, an advantage over the tissue because you can circumvent heterogeneity um, basically by the biopsy, or which is an, 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 a natural part of the biopsy and then no way can, can to circumvent it. Cell-free DNA has certainly a way. What I mean with that, if we go and diagnose cancer, we need to do it in a way as the cancer is. Cancer is multidimensional. 
we need to diagnose it multidimensional and we cannot continue to only look at mutations alone. So what we need to do, we need to have an integrated dynamic analysis where we're looking into the proteome, in the transcriptome, and so on and so forth, really in order to move the needle and to change patient stratification factors. Patient stratification factors cannot only be based on mutation spectrum alone. So what we really need, we have the hallmarks of cancer, we need the hallmarks of technology. What that means, we really need to apply, so to say, what, the, what is the way to assess at various stages, various sub-diseases, various uh, parts of what drives cancer in, in a very comprehensive way, and then we have a possibility to really change it. What I mean with that, and this is basically what we as an SGG kind of discussed and put forward, is really this integrated dynamic personalized cancer care or personalized cancer treatment. What that means, normally what you do, a patient is treated until progressive disease. We call that clinical PFS. We treat the patient with a second line treatment and third line treatment at a certain point in time. Patient is diseased and we call that clinical overall survival. If we change to a more molecular aspect, we can measure when the mutation disappears or when an additional mutation, whatever comes, comes into play. And then we change it. So we move from a clinical PFS to a molecular PFS. That really can, uh, can enable us basically really to change the treatment paradigms that the, the second line treatment may actually become a larger one or a longer period the patient is treated because you address the clone the moment it occurs and you don't let the clone grow, which we would do in the, in the, in the upper part. And then you go into a third line treatment and so on and so forth. I think by just doing that, and there is evidence, this is not only fantasy, um, so we can really extend the life of the patient and make a big difference. So the future is really here in a way. And this is a, a work from Nick Turner. He works in, in London in the Royal Marston. And, and uh, um, he looked basically at, at patients, neoadjuvant breast cancer treatments, so where he basically assessed at the baseline cell-free DNA. And, and the, the patient you see here, he had 12 copies at the baseline. And then after surgery, zero copies were left. So the treatment, the neoadjuvant treatment were extremely successful. And the patient was disease-free two years later. Here's another one. Similar number of, of uh, uh, cell-free DNA copies at, uh, uh, at baseline, post-surgery seven copies remained, meaning the neoadjuvant treatment was not so successful. The patient relapsed six months later. Here's the difference. And you know it. You know it by one technology, and this is cell-free DNA, that this patient is going to relapse. And the same is true, basically, just to, to uh, uh, complete the story here. If you look at cell-free DNA as a prognostic factor, so the black line is basically where no cell-free DNA has been detected directly after the surgery. Those patients had a very good prognosis versus the red one, which had, in generally, and it doesn't matter which num how many and so on and so forth, so which had cell-free DNA remaining in the bloodstream, in the circulation, they relapsed earlier. And if you continue that, is exactly what I said before, throughout the treatment and see what happens and when things come on, you definitely see that those patients who develop or get cell-free DNA later into the bloodstream, meaning the tumor reoccurs and, and things starting to happen, those patients have a good prognosis who don't, and those ones who do have a bad prognosis. So that really is, is a conceptual proof um, for what I just laid out to give you an idea where we really want to take it. And this also works in a way if you talk about the big scheme of the decade, immune oncology, of course. So immune oncology, one way to assess should a patient, yes or no, getting an immune checkpoint inhibitor is, is mutational load. Mutational load means how many mutations does the tumor have because mutations create new antigens, because mutations create different proteins, and because frame shifts happen and so on and so forth. Even more so if you're talking about insertions and deletions. So there's really a frame shift uh, on, on the situation, and these insertions and deletions can really foster new and or basically new antigens, which trigger and or can target, so to say, uh, um, can be a target for immune oncology agents. So this is uh, um, a paper which has looked at mutational load in, in various disease areas, so to say. And as you can say, you can really classify it, in, in, if you want, in three groups. So frequent, um, intermediate, so to say, and, and rare or, or occasionally, so to say, um, mutation, high mutation load. And that kind of can really help you as well. Because you can, and this is just an example for BRAF mutation in various cases, you can say the patient who has a BRAF mutation and a high mutational load is that a patient I need to treat with an immune oncology agent, or do I need to treat it with a targeted one? That's the question. The other way is, 
every patient who has a high mutation load, so that patient already all automatically be treated with an immune oncology agent, and the one who have a low one automatically treated with a targeted one? I don't have the answer, but I mean, it's definitely something which helps and which this tool really provides to work here further. So the limitations of today's treatment paradigm, basically, and as an example of lung cancer, is that we need repeated biopsies. We don't follow the patient on a dynamic way. We don't really look into how, how the tumor evolves, what is the evolution of the tumor under evolutionary pressure, which means basically under treatment. So in the future, we really hope this integrated dynamic personalized cancer care, what we have as a bit of a scheme for the, the SGG and where we want projects, ideas, and, and also, uh, of course, welcome uh, you, and, and this is part of the workshop. Um, what can we do, how can we do it, and, and, and how should it go? Really, it's a more dynamic one. It's integrated, that we measure more on, on the time it happens, make treatment decisions dynamically and not statically by when basically we see an, an, an reoccurrence of disease or relapse or whatsoever. So, and we also really believe this has the potential to be a game changer in the disease management. Why is that? If you look where personalized healthcare, if you want, plays a role, it's not only at the time when you need a therapy selection or when you need a diagnosis, so to say. Those are really the two most prominent parts in cancer treatment or in the life of a patient's journey where this kind of um, assessments make a difference and, and, and utilized broadly, or at least uh, uh, in, in many parts of the world, utilized very broadly. But we need to continue. We need to do it as well, basically, when the patient is without symptoms and when the patient is on, the cancer, on, on a journey, so to say, of a treatment. And that's where we need to apply the same principles what we apply at the beginning of the disease and of a disease management. So it's a little bit provocative, but and don't take it personally in any way. So uh, we really believe silos are for farms, but not for pharma. And, um, and that means really that we need to break the silos which are existing, which are existing in every part. They exist in every company, there's no doubt about it. They exist, basically, data are not shared. What happens in UK is not necessarily known and accessible to France, to Germany, to Italy, wherever you want to go. So, and those are really the, the idea of what we have and what we want to do, really fostering collaborations, fostering exchange, and really fostering, basically, the way we work together and, and we can really make, make a difference uh, here. And that's why I called it gap check, so to say. Gap check means is really a stimulating uh, 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 discussion. What I want to get going here this throughout the day is what needs, who need to be on the table? How can we make that happen? What ideas do you think need to come forward? And that definitely is, is something which needs a lot of people. And, and it's not only research, pharma, and, and clinical trials or clinical development. We see we need uh, uh, p uh, people from, uh, who talk about patient access. We need certainly regulators, EMA, of course, um, FDA, because no truck is only registered in one part of the world. We need patient advocacy organizations, patient advocacy groups. We definitely need uh, um, big data, big data company. We have also later on uh, um, additional uh, uh, presentation around big data um, pricing big topic, you know, how can it made accessible to, to everyone and or, or many of the patients, not only to a very selective group or in special countries. And safety, how can we increase basically the way drugs are given, how can we make the side effects less prominent or basically have a way we can exclude patients from getting side effects because we can measure it. We can detect this patient is prone to experience a side effect and this patient is not. And of course, research plays a big role um, that we need to understand really kind of um, how we get those things together. With that, I really want to, sh to uh, close here and, and thank you for your attention. And um, if you have any questions, we can uh, have one or two now and then we move on with the, section and, uh, with the session and have it basically in the afternoon section, um, a big uh, discussion. Thank you.